All right, Sandra, let's bring in Republican presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, who's here in Washington, D.C. So uh, this newest demonstration of belligerence on the part of the Chinese. I mean, clearly this is a huge issue. We've got their warships that are harassing our warships. We've got their jet fighters harassing our surveillance planes. As president, how would you deal with it? Well, look, I think one of the great risks that we face is a consequence of our own policy, John, the divest to invest policy. I don't think that makes any sense. That puts us at our nadir of naval capacity there around 2026 or 2027. That's when China would actually be in prime position to go after Taiwan. But I think the number one threat we need to pay attention to, and this is also brewing as we speak, is closer ties between Russia and China, the Sino-Russian alliance, codified first in 2001, amped up last year in the No Limits partnership that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin announced. I think we need to focus on driving a wedge between that Sino-Russian alliance, because I think that is the single greatest military threat that we're going to face. And it's what gives Xi Jinping the confidence that he needs to risk war with the U.S. over Taiwan on the bet that the U.S. won't want to actually go after two different nuclear superpowers at the same time. So that's with, actually the focus of my foreign policy. With it being your goal then uh, to to make it into the White House and you look at what is happening with China and their aggression there. Do you believe any U.S. corporations should be doing business in China? How far are you willing to go? I'm willing to go the direction of total decoupling. I would ban most U.S. businesses from doing business in China unless and until the CCP reforms its behaviors. I'm talking about actual real measures, no data theft, no intellectual property theft, no more turning our own companies into your geopolitical pawns to do your bidding using lobbying conditions. That would have serious economic access. consequences in this country. It I think it would have some short-term economic consequences, Sandra, but I do think that we can make those sacrifices if we know what we're sacrificing for. I also think that it is when you are most willing to make a sacrifice that you don't actually have to make one at all. I would call that a little bit more Churchill, a little less Chamberlain in our foreign policy. I think Xi Jinping will fold if he actually knows that we mean it. He will meet our conditions. I also think that if we're willing to re-enter and reopen some of those trade relationships with Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, even talking about India, you want to talk about Thailand, you want to talk about Vietnam, Brazil, I think that makes this a lot more tractable than we make it out to be. So I think this is achievable. Yes, it will involve some willingness to make a sacrifice, but if we're willing to make it, then I don't actually think that Xi Jinping will go the distance of calling that bluff. So, so at the beginning, Vivek, you, you said that what you're really concerned about is this Sino-Russia uh, partnership. Yes. And you need to drive a wedge through it. But one, you said yesterday that one of the ways you would try to drive a wedge through it is to make some concessions to Putin on Ukraine. You brought up Neville Chamberlain. He tried to do that with Hitler. Didn't work out very well. Why would it work out any better with Putin? Well, this is the equivalent of if we could go back and actually disrupt the German-Japan alliance. Boy, would we have wanted to do that at a time we could. So the way I look at this, John, is it's a reverse maneuver of what Nixon did with Mao. Mao was not some hero that we aspire to, some paragon of democracy. I don't trust Putin any more than Nixon trusted Mao, except this time Putin is the new Mao. Disrupt that alliance, move from a bilateral international order right now that favors China to a trilateral international order where there's no allies between the two ma three major nuclear but, superpowers. But you talk about making concessions uh, with Russia on yes. Ukraine and maybe letting Putin have Donbass. What makes you think he would stop there? Well, because I think almost every military analyst that we have talked to on this program says you give him Donbass, you give him time, he regroups, he rearms, and then he goes after the rest of the country. So a carrot and a stick. I think the number one thing they need to do is exit the treaty that they have with China, dating back to 2001. No more joint military exercises or otherwise. And if he reneges, then we go back on the things that we said we would agree to give him, which is what we're saying is no Ukraine admission to NATO. Freeze the current lines of control. That's a Korean War style armistice agreement. But if Putin reneges on that, now we're talking about a maximum pressure campaign in terms of economic sanctions. Now we're talking about immediate admission of Ukraine to NATO. And that'll be worse off for him. And Putin has no incentive because right now he doesn't like being Xi Jinping's little brother in that relationship. So if we're actually reopening economic relations with Russia, if we're actually committing that Ukraine's never going to become part of NATO and freeze those lines of control, yes, those are major concessions, but it's in service of a bigger U.S. interest, and that is disrupting that partnership between Russia and China. If you combine them, you're talking about the largest nuclear stockpile in the world in Russia's hands, combined with China's economy and economic might, 
That's actually what fuels Xi Jinping's ability to be aggressive in Taiwan and beyond. That's the real risk that we face. Vivek, we at the top of the last hour got General Kellogg's reaction to what is happening in China and what happened over the weekend. And he said this about the current administration's policies. They look at us and we don't have a plan. And because we haven't played, had a plan or played hard with the Chinese, the, the chance of, a, of something happening that it is going to be really serious, let's look at Taiwan, it is very, very real into the near future. Okay, into the near future. What is your level of urgency here on something like that actually becoming a reality? The level of urgency is high. I think that both the need in the United States of the semiconductor supply chain that begins in Taiwan, that powers our modern way of life, which actually makes that much closer to the American national interest than, frankly, anything that relates to Ukraine at all. So I think that at least until we have full semiconductor self-sufficiency in the United States, it is an urgent priority to deter Chinese aggression against Taiwan. Again, I think if you take Russia's backing out from under China, that will have to make Xi Jinping think twice before he goes after Taiwan. Mm. But I do worry that the Taiwanese election in 2024, frankly, even the U.S. presidential election in 2024, if you have candidates like myself or others taking the positions we are, Xi Jinping may accelerate his plans from the late 2020s to even sooner. And I do think that's a top foreign policy threat that we face. Let me just come back uh, here ashore and talk about uh, big tech interference in, in politics, because you claim that you were interfered with. You had your LinkedIn account restricted. Bobby Kennedy Jr. was uh, on a, one of our programs recently uh, saying that uh, he was not able to create an account on Instagram because of his anti-vaccine uh, stance. Is this big tech with its thumb on the scales yet again? I think it is happening all over again. This is the beginnings of tech interference that we're going to see in this election. And the way I think it's going to play out this time, John, is they've learned their lesson last time around. They're going to be less transparent this time. So though I think LinkedIn was a little bit sloppy, and that's Microsoft who owns LinkedIn, they were sloppy with me, locking the account of a U.S. presidential candidate for making fact-supported statements about climate change policy. And then saying it was a mistake after they sent you multiple yeah. detailed emails <laughs> as to why you were being restricted. Right. They were embarrassed that they did it when we called them out. Though that's the early sloppy version. But what I predict we're going to see is actually a version of shadow banning where they're using algorithms to de-amp or amp up or amp down the kinds of messages that they do and don't want to see. And I think that's one of the great forms of election interference that has actually gone really under-discussed, is the ability for these behemoth corporations to make what is the largest version of in-kind campaign contribution that they could make to a political candidate, tilting the scales of debate itself in the direction that they actually deem appropriate. So I think it's actually time to look at all kinds of laws. You want know, to take a look at anti-fraud laws, telling consumers that you're doing one thing when, in fact, you're doing another. Election interference, including constructive campaign contributions, as well as even abuses of government authority. I want to know what kind of implicit instruction they're getting from the White House as to what they do and do not censor, as we've seen over the last few years. I think we need a comprehensive response to probably the single greatest risk of election interference. And it's ironically coming from right here at home. Vivek, if you could just hold with us for uh, a moment, we're going to get live to the White House as John Kirby is taking questions on China and answering one right now. We're going to continue to monitor John Kirby live out of the White House, obviously responding to the latest aggressions from China. Vivek Ramaswamy, John, still with us there in Washington. Uh, Vivek, we'd be curious your response to what you're hearing. And is this the message you want this White House to be sending? I think we are being repeatedly tested inch by inch by China. I personally think the Chinese spy balloon flying over half our country, we would have shut that, we would have shot that down if that were a Russian spy balloon and ratcheted up sanctions. Instead, we carefully waited for it to leave the Atlantic, be over the Atlantic Ocean before we shot it down. This is the same game that they're playing. They're testing us. And I think we're consistently exhibiting weakness. And I think that while we're attempting to display strength vis-a-vis -vis Russia, we're actually exhibiting a lot of weakness with respect to the real top threat that we face, which is aggressive communist China, which we actually need to deter their aggression. Yeah, you and I were having a very spirited conversation uh, while keeping one ear yeah. to the uh, White House briefing. And you had some idea about how we could strategically decouple economically from China and, and do it in such a way that it would have minimal economic impact and maximum effective insulating us against Chinese aggression and uh, the, uh, the sanctity and, and uh, solidity of our supply chain. That's exactly right. Part of the reason why when we're tested inch by inch militarily by China, why we don't do anything is because we're still dependent on them for our modern way of life. So how can we change that at minimal cost to Americans? 
I think one of the ways we do it, and this is one of the ways where I depart from Trump, is actually restoring trade relationships with our non-Chinese trading partners. Japan and South Korea, much of South America, we can talk about Australia, India, a range of other countries that can actually fill otherwise redundancies in the supply chain the that treaty, we might miss. The treaty that Trump pulled out of. Exactly. And I think that the silver lining in Trump having pulled out of it is that gives us perhaps even better leverage. If I'm the president, I think that's an even better starting point as leverage to say, talk to Japan and say, hey, we don't like the state owned enterprises and subsidies. Negotiate even better terms than we had at the time that Trump left. I'll make lemonade out of it, if you will, and use that starting point with greater leverage to re-enter those trade relationships and then sit across the table from Xi Jinping when we have that stronger hand and say, I really mean it. When we're declaring independence, we're cutting off ties unless you radically reform from mercantilism to actual global capitalism. I think Xi Jinping will have to fold. They're in a tougher spot in this relationship than we are if we actually are willing to open our eyes up and see it. But that will take a combination of strategy, as I've laid out on the trade side, as well as fortitude to stand up with a spine across the table from Xi Jinping such that he knows the president of the United States actually means okay. it. And it's my understanding of this that leads me to want to do this now. Vivek, before you go, I have two quick questions. Maybe you could be real quick. Did, did you change your swing after the Patrick McEnroe constructive criticism? Are you bringing it farther back? I did. He and wanted up. me to take the, the forehand backswing up a little higher. I'm on the case as I play college students now. Yeah. Um, pretty amazing stuff. That video was fun. Uh, second question and final question. How do you describe yourself? Are you, are you a centrist candidate? I mean, you're described in many headlines as anti-woke GOP candidate. Where, where are you? How do you label yourself? I'm an unapologetic American nationalist. What do I mean by that? I embrace the ideals of the American Revolution. We need to revive that. Anti-woke is too small. I'm not just running from something. I'm leading us to run to something. Our vision of what it actually means to be an American. The last president to do that was Ronald Reagan, and I'm doing it based on first principles and moral authority. I think we take our America first agenda even further. I'm a George Washington America first conservative. That'd be the label that I'd use. Okay. All right. Vivek, great to see you in D.C. Drop by anytime. Thank you. Good Appreciate seeing you. It. All right. Thank you.